Our text for today comes to us from Luke chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. Listen now for a word from God. Then Jesus said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, oh, what will I do? Now that my master is taking the position away from me, I'm, I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ash- too ashamed to beg, and I've decided what to do. I've decided what to do so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, How much do you owe my master? And he answered, A hundred jugs of olive oil. And he said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it fifty. Then he asked another, And how much do you owe? He replied, A hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and make it eighty. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in very little is faithful also in much, and whoever is dishonest in very little is dishonest also in much." If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust you to the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. This is God's word to us. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Good and loving God, thank you for your word. Thank you for tricky parables. And God, thank you again for loving us. Lord, I pray whatever words we hear this morning would come from you and not from me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Someone came up to me before the service and said, uh, good luck. <laughs> they were talking about this, this parable that you just, you just heard about a dishonest manager. It's a tough one, and I want you to know that up front. No one knows what to do with it. I read a lot of commentaries this week on it, and they didn't say anything, nothing helpful. They were all like, ugh. We don't know, which is a a, a great thing to say in a book uh, supposedly chock full of wisdom. It's a tough one. It's a tough one. But I want to come at it from this angle of love, and I want to focus in on this value that we've selected at Fort Street. And we're going to do a series of of three sermons on these values, love, justice, and inclusion— and th- I think the question that I had most this morning was, we talk about love, and, and I think often it's, it's overused in the church. It's a little cliche. We say it, and we think we know what we mean. We never explain it, and we just sort of go on. And, yeah, we should love people without ever asking how, why, what does it mean? And because we do so many weddings around here, I, I, I spend a lot of time talking about love like that. And so the question I had this week was, well, what do you do (laughs) with unlovable people? (laughs) You know, what do you do with that person? How do you love them, the people that you actually don't know how to love? (laughs) People that it seems like, oh, maybe they're not worthy of love, right? What do we do then? Sometime last year, there was this big event going on in downtown Detroit, and um, whenever that happens, we're kind of on notice here at the church to make sure the parking lot is secure, because this is kind of prime real estate for some events, especially at Huntington Place over here, 
And so we don't want people using the lot, you know, in ways that uh, we, we wouldn't approve of. And th this big event was, was happening, and uh, for some reason it kind of slipped our radar. We just didn't know about it and, uh, until I got a phone call on like a Saturday morning, and it was uh, Derek Sale, our facilities manager. He said, hey, do you know why the parking lot's full? And I said, I, I don't. Maybe there's some kind of event going on at the church that I just I didn't know about. Well, there wasn't. He came inside. The church was empty. And so he goes outside and he, he does some investigating and he finds out that someone's been selling spots in our lot for $20 a space, <laughs> right? Not only are they selling spots in this lot, but they're selling spots in the alley, okay? $20 a space. <laughs> Not only are they doing that, but they're selling spots in our neighbor's lots right back here, $20 a space. And, and the line was, oh, it's a donation for the church, just $20. You give it to the church, blah, blah, blah. And he's, you know, he's running this racket. I find out about it, and I, I almost, like, took it personally, you know. <laughs> I was, like, offended by this. Like, how, how could someone do this to the church? How could you lie to people and steal their money and give them a place to park that wasn't yours to give? How could someone do this to a church? I wanted justice. <laughs> so we, I, I actually did call. I called the cops. I said, hey, this guy's doing this. Just so you know, we didn't have a description or anything, but if you see someone out here selling these spaces, let us know, and we'll, we, we will work with you. I wanted him to pay. I wanted justice. I wanted something to happen because I didn't want this to keep happening to people. You know, $20 a space, that's quite a bit of money for a parking space. And then to lie about it and say that it's a donation to the church, I mean, ugh, people like that, you know? People like that, that would steal, lie. Anyone else have a big problem with people like that? No, <laughs> a few of you. A bunch of saints in the room today. <laughs> How do you love a person like that, you know? How do you love a person like that? I'll share another story of an unlovable person. When I was in fourth, I think it was fourth or fifth grade, it was definitely in elementary school. Um, I, I, I've shared with you, you know, I used to have red hair. I still do. It still grows. But um, I, I got picked on a lot for my red hair. Really, any difference, I feel like, for kids, they get picked on. But my red hair was always the butt of some joke. Um, on top of that, I was a little overweight. I had glasses. You know, I didn't always have the coolest clothes or anything, and I was just kind of a prime target. And there was one kid in particular, I'll, I'll call him John. John, who was always, always on me about something. Always making fun of my hair. Always making fun of my shoes. Always making fun of my, my glasses. What, you know, whatever it was. He was always, always going. You ever met someone like this that's kind of a bully, doesn't leave you alone? Anyone? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I there was one day, we're, we're playing basketball on the playground, and John was really laying into me. And he wasn't even playing basketball that well, but he's still kind of talking trash. And going and going, making jokes, and finally something in me just snapped. And I turned around and I just punched him the first time I'd ever been in a fight. And I jumped on top of him, and we're wrestling around, and then pretty soon the teachers come and they separate us. And one of the teachers grabbed me, you know, I was on one side, John's on the other side, and we're kind of mouthing back and forth, and starts to walk us to the principal's office. When John says something else, he said something about my mother, and I can't, I can't even repeat anything that was said, you know. But he says something about my mother, and I snapped again, and I got away from the teacher, and I went, and I jumped on top of him again, and two fights in like two minutes, you know, and, and I'm going to the principal's office for it, and I've never been to the principal's office, and I've, I've always been a pretty good kid, just shy. I, I really just wanted to hide because I didn't want to be picked on, and, and, and so I, I never experienced something like this. But the whole time I'm walking to the principal's office, I'm thinking, I better not get in trouble for this, you know. I better not get, in, you know, John had it coming to him. He had it coming to him because for my, it was like my entire elementary school career, this kid had been picking on me for having red hair, 
picking on me for having glasses, picking on me for things that like I could not control and I finally just exploded. How do you love someone like that? How do you love the bully? How do you love the person that picks on others? Shows their strength by pointing out what appear to be other people's weaknesses. How do you love them? One of my first classes in seminary, we were all gathered around in a circle, and the professor opened uh, our seminary careers with this question. What's the single biggest thing stopping you from being an effective minister? What's the thing when you get into ministry that's going to stop you from being an effective minister? It's a really good question. In fact, I would invite you all to ask yourselves, what's the thing stopping you from effectively loving other people? Because that, that was essentially the question. And I think my answer was something like, you know, my, my ego in some ways. Because at a time when church is in decline, statistics are, you know, painting this really bleak story, it feels difficult to lead through that. You know, it feels difficult to hold that and to know that uh, there may not be a traditional definition of success for me at any point in my career. And I, and I said that to the class, and I, I thought that was a pretty good answer. And then the, the woman beside me gave the best answer, I think, of anyone there, though. She looked right at the professor in a, in a room full of pastors, and she says, I really don't love people. <laughs> and it got pretty quiet, <laughs> and, and we're all thinking, what are you doing here <laughs> if, you, if you don't love people? But she went on to explain, she said, look, I, I, I had a tough childhood, and I have trust issues, I don't know how much love I've received in my life, and I think that's going to be the biggest thing stopping me from being an effective minister is my inability to love people. And I really appreciated her honesty. I really appreciated her vulnerability. And I couldn't believe that someone would admit that, confess it. How do you love those people, but then also how do you love when maybe you haven't been shown how to love? So in our text for today, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And this is important because Luke is naming for us an audience here. This is not going to just a big crowd of people. It's not being spoken to the Pharisees. It's not being spoken to anybody but the disciples. And so I think in some ways, me and you today. He's speaking to his disciples, and he tells them this story. And what a weird story it is. He says, once there was a wealthy property owner and a land manager... And these are two characters that any the, the disciples listening would have heard about. The property owners were just rich people that owned land around, especially like the city-states. They would own land around it and uh, cultivate the fields, maybe raise cattle, things like that. They, they were wealthy, and they were a pretty integral part to the political system because they helped raise taxes because of all of the commodities that they had. Um, they, they, were, they were big players at the time. A lot of times they had to leave because they were dealing with politics and these affairs in the world and so they would take off for a long time and they would hire these land managers these people to make sure that their estate was you know doing the things it needed to make sure they're making money blah 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 well the land managers often made money in the same way that uh, like tax collectors made money they would sort of skim off the top so if if the, uh, the, the landowner wanted a certain profit or knew that there would be a certain surplus from their fields and their property, what the land manager would do was sort of take a cut off the top of that. Maybe pay the tax and, you know, take a little bit for himself and then give the rest to the land manager, as lo or the landowner, so long as they were getting what they expected. They would steal, essentially. And this dishonest manager and Jesus' story is found out. And the property owner travels a great distance to come back and says, 
what is this that I hear about you? You have been mismanaging my property. Give me an account of it because you are fired. (laughs) And the land manager sort of sits there for a second and, you know, he doesn't spend a lot of time groveling or anything, but he just asks a couple questions. He's like, oh, gosh, what am I going to do now? I'm, I'm too old to do manual labor. I can't dig ditches. I can't, I can't do that. I'm too proud to beg. I, you know, and who would give money to someone who had been a land manager before anyway? I mean, this guy should have a lot of money. So he's too ashamed to do that. What is he going to do? So he comes up with this plan. And he calls in his master's debtors one by one. And he says to the first one, he says, how much do you owe my master? And he says, a hundred jugs of oil. And he says, okay, quick. Um, write it down. Make it 50. You only owe him 50 now. And here, write that. Sign the receipt. There you go. You're on your way. And he goes to the next person. He says, how much do you owe, how much do you owe my master? And he says, oh, I owe him a hundred bushels of wheat or a hundred barrels of wheat, whatever the measurement was. He says, okay, uh, quick, write it down, make it, make it 80. He signs the receipt and he goes on his way. Well, the property owner finds out about this. The land manager's master finds out about this. And in Jesus' telling of this story, he praises the dishonest manager. He essentially says, good on you for acting shrewdly. Good on you for behaving this way. Good on you for being dishonest with my wealth. Not once, right, for the reason he got fired, but twice now. While he was hired and then after he was fired, he's still stealing and taking and being dishonest so that he can gain. There was one commentary that said the dishonest manager was... (laughs) Was, was so dishonest that not only did he take, you know, while he was hired and then also while he was fired, but he puts the land owner in a position where he really can't do anything. I mean, he doesn't want to seem, the landowner wouldn't want to seem um, not generous by not making sure that the debts, let me back this up, by, by decreasing the debts, the land manager essentially makes sure that Uh, the property owner looks good because the debts were reduced. And so the property manager looks generous, the property owner looks generous, and the property owner has to sit on his hands and say, well, what what can I do? And so he blesses him. He says, good on you for being so shrewd, being so wise. And this is where a lot of preachers will kind of stop. They'll say, you know, what Jesus is trying to do here it's to say it's, it's really good to be creative in tough situations. When you find yourself, you're back against the wall, you've got to find a way out. You've got to make a way forward. You have to, I've heard one theologian say, you have to make a way where no way exists. And this is what this guy does. He's fired, his back's against the wall. He gets up this creative thing, and, and he endears himself to other people so that maybe after he's fired, he has somewhere to go. And Jesus praises this behavior. But as I was reading this week, thinking about who Jesus is speaking this to, I started to wonder if there was a different side to this. Not just that Jesus is holding up this virtue, and I I think it is a virtue, right? To be, we might call it street smart, right? Street wise, quick on your feet, creative. Those are good things. This guy has some hustle to him, you know? He needs to live as well. And I think Jesus is lifting that up, but also he's saying it to his disciples who in my reading of the Gospels, have a really hard time loving some people. In fact, at the beginning of this section where Jesus sort of launches into teaching all of these parables and and having all these wisdom sayings, Jesus begins, I believe this is in Luke chapter 5, with that famous command, love one another as you love yourselves. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And so if he's speaking it to his disciples who often have trouble loving, I I thought, how could we read the parable in that context? So here's my theory. Maybe Jesus is saying to a group of people, 
that have a hard time loving others, especially certain people. You know, these land managers making their wealth dishonestly, doing it on the backs of poor people often. If he could tell them a story and find one thing, just one thing in this dishonest manager that was good, something they could connect to, something that they could latch onto, something that they saw in themselves, maybe they could love that person. <laughs> and if you can love that person, maybe you can love other people. And so while it's often translated and interpreted as sort of a warning against, you know, trying to serve God and wealth, which is pretty explicit in the text, I think, too, Jesus is trying to teach us how to love by holding up perhaps one of the most despicable people he can think of, throwing him before the disciples and saying, here's at least one good quality about this person. He's creative. He's desperate. He wants to live. He's helping other people as he's trying to live. Isn't that something to love? Jesus, I think, is teaching his disciples to see people with new eyes. Because it's so easy just to look and say, oh, he was dishonest. The text says he's unrighteous, which is the same word that's used for people that are sinners and, and, and are going to hell in other parts of Scripture. This person is unrighteous. He's not worthy to receive this, according to some teachers. But Jesus, Jesus says, no. I see at least one thing. What about you? The professor who was in that seminary class kind of facilitating our conversation, who asked the class the question, what's the one thing in your life that's going to stop you from being an effective minister? After she heard the response of my classmate about not being able to love people, she gave me that line I've been using all morning. She said something like, well, maybe you can start by finding one thing to love in those people that you really don't love. And then if you can find that one thing that you love, maybe you can find two, and if you can find two, maybe you can find three, and if you can find three, well, maybe you could admit that you do love people. I've heard this said differently, I think, in Buddhist circles, where if you find yourself empty of love, try loving a rock. If you can love a rock, maybe you can love a blade of grass. And if you can love a blade of grass and a rock, maybe you can love a whole field. If you can love a field, maybe you can love a tree. If you love a tree, maybe you can love a forest. And if you love a forest, maybe you can love the earth. And so on and so forth. When I was sitting in the principal's office waiting for Mr. Austin to come out and uh, presumably paddle us, that was still a thing when I was in school. I'm, I'm dating myself there, but I thought we were going to get the paddle. And the paddle hung, um, <laughs> this is one of those like draconian tactics that have hopefully been removed from schools now, but um, he put the paddle, like there was, there was his office and then there was a little reception area before you went into his office. And the paddle was on the wall as you entered the door. So you, like you knew it was always an option. And, and it had holes drilled in it, which I'm told is so that he could get, you know, greater velocity on it. And, it, you know, you're just sitting there as a kid and you're staring at this thing like, oh, that's what's next, huh? <laughs> and Mr. Austin was like, I mean, he was like all of 6'6", six, six, and he, he was a big guy. But as we're waiting in that lobby and staring up at that paddle, and I'm just thinking, I better not get in trouble for this. John, the bully, turns to me, and with tears in his eyes, he says, I'm really sorry, Garrett. I'm really sorry. This is my fault. I'm going to tell Mr. Austin that I started this. I shouldn't have done it. I've been picking on you for years. I don't know why. I just, I'm sorry. And at that moment, all my anger left. <laughs> How do you not love someone like that? That shows a little bit of humility. I didn't want justice for him anymore. 
In fact, I, would, I think I was just shocked and still like, what are, you, what are you saying? But he apologized. And he reached his hand out and he shook my hand, you know. And after that, we became friends. <laughs> and we were friends all through high school. And I still talk to him to this day. I was complaining for weeks after the guy was selling spots in our parking lot over here. <laughs> Anyone that would listen, was like, did you hear about that guy that was selling spots in our parking lot for $20 a piece and saying that it was a donation to the church to these innocent people? And someone caught me in the narthex when I was doing that. And she said to me, she said, you know, you can't knock his hustle. You can't knock his hustle, Pastor. And I thought, you know, no, you can't. No, you can't knock his hustle. I don't know what situation he was in. I don't know why he needed that money. I don't know why he had to do what he had to do, but, man, he made a lot of money. <laughs> and it was a pretty creative way to do it. He's got some hustle to him. And that's at least one thing I can appreciate. You might think that there are a lot of people in this world that don't deserve love, that are, it's impossible to love, you're incapable of loving them, and I'm saying this especially as we enter into a year of elections, a year of politics, a year of Facebook posts and Twitter posts and all of the fighting and the division that is most likely to come time when it's really easy to hate, time when it's easy to say, that's my enemy, that's my enemy. Boy, if all of those people would just leave the country, we would be much better off. We're entering into that season, and I think Jesus' challenge for us, my challenge for all of us, can you find things to love? Doesn't mean you have to change your mind politically. Doesn't mean that we all have to think the same. It doesn't mean any of that. But can you look through those things that divide us, those biases that we have? Can you see through them to see a human being, someone you can love? I invite you all this week just give you a little bit of homework here, okay? Spend 30 seconds, okay? 30 seconds. Put a timer on your phone. Close your eyes. Think of those people that you have a really hard time loving. It might be someone at work. It might be someone sitting in the pew next to you. <laughs> Not a lot of laughs on that one. <laughs> it might be someone in your family. It might be politician, a neighbor. Think about the people that you cannot love and try to find one thing, one thing that you can love. Start there and see what happens. Let's pray. Good and loving God, thank you for today. And thank you for holding up the unlovable people those that we are quick to dismiss. And Lord, teach us in your wisdom and in your mercy to love as you love. In Jesus' name, amen.